Okay, everybody can hear me okay? Yep. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much for joining, Michelle. I'm really excited. This is an AMA with obviously Michelle Fan, beauty mogul, and Lolly CEO Alex Edelman. Ah, that means um, everyone at home can ask okay? questions. Yep. Awesome. And I'll be peeking uh, over and you asking know, audience really questions excited. to you guys as well. AMA with obviously Michelle Fan. And so just to get us started, um, I'm curious to hear, uh, Michelle, can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Perfect, perfect. Um, we were talking about all the information that there is about Bitcoin. There's so much information and so much wrong information. Uh, what do you think is important for people, especially early on, to focus on? And what is it really not necessary for them to keep up with? I can only share from my personal experience. Uh, originally, when I first just started hearing about Bitcoin, it was really through a lot of my uh, friends who are PC gamers. Um, they have crazy rigs and they were mining Bitcoin out of their home. And this was really early where anyone with a really powerful computer could technically mine. I mean, it's totally different today, especially with uh, the halving. Um, and so that's actually how I learned about it. And it was interesting because I think at that time, a lot of people were just saying, oh, it's not real money. And so in the early beginning, I think I was just already turned off by it. I, I just, cause I was hearing, I was hearing a lot of hearsay. People were saying, oh, it's not real. But it wasn't until I would say I started to build uh, more wealth and I wanted to diversify my portfolio. And I was just looking at like different ways to diversify it, like buying property, investing in the stock market and gold, of course, and precious metals. And then that was when I got interested in Bitcoin because, um, as I learned more about gold, and it just it just made so much sense to me, like, wow, there is a reason why uh, we've been using the gold standard for thousands and thousands of years. I wonder if there's like a digital version of this. And that was actually how I learned about Bitcoin. So I would say for everyone, it's different. It's personal for everyone. Maybe for some people, they want to learn about Bitcoin or they're discovering it because um, they are uh, FOMO, like they don't want to miss out. Um, maybe if, like for myself, I wanted to learn and understand more about money. For others, they want to diversify. Maybe for uh, some other people, they want to make some money, so they want to get into trading. I would say for everyone is different, but the fundamental thing that I think drove me was curiosity. So if you're just curious, you're a curious person, you want to learn about uh, where the market is heading and how uh, technology like Bitcoin can uh, make a fundamental change in just everything that we know of, um, I think that's a great start. Gotcha. So we already have some audience questions. Uh, first one is for you, Alex. It says, what are the pros and cons of using a browser extension as the UX? Um, and if you see any parallels between your model and Honey. Yeah, so uh, we, we, we know Honey well. I've, I've gotten to know Ryan and George, the founders uh, of Honey, uh, over the last five years now. And I was, um, you know, some fun sort of inside baseball about them. I think a lot of people doubted them in the early days. They said, oh, it's just coupons. It's just a, you know, it's just, it's just a Chrome extension. And they weren't able to raise VC money. They, they had a very difficult time just as a startup. And I got to know them and got to see like their big vision. And one of the things that they always, the way that they looked at themselves, the way that they looked at Honey is they looked at if you are a Chrome extension and if you are at the point of purchase, that is the most important part of the funnel. And so every time that you go to check out and you see Honey come up and you have a coupon, you trust them. You have this feel good experience with them. I think that the thing that they solved with their business that Bitcoin has yet to solve, which is how do you be a part of everyday life? How do you be a part of every purchasing experience? And so we learned a lot from them over the last five years. They clearly had a ton of success exiting to PayPal for $4 billion. And so, yeah, we were very inspired by them. Um, both when we were building our last company and then when we were acquired by Rakuten, which was a you know honey competitor, more or less. Um, and then when we started looking at Lolly and, and we made this decision to either go mobile or Chrome extension, we wanted to reach the most amount of people and we wanted to do something that felt intuitive. And so everybody knows honey. Everyone was very familiar with Lolly um, when we came out and it felt very similar. And so if, if we think that that Bitcoin is going to transform payments in the future, but rewards are a great way to get it to the masses to start. Um, we, we think that the best way to do that is through a Chrome extension. Gotcha. And you were talking about being that point that the consumer sees and interacts with. Michelle, one of the audience questions for you is about how 
entrepreneurs and developers can evolve with users. For anyone who is not in the beauty space, Michelle is very, very widely known, but not controversial at all, which is weird, right? Like just, she's been able to evolve along with her audience. Um, and we've been able to see uh, different parts of your business. And I'm really curious to hear from you exactly to this audience member's question of how do you evolve with a user base once the hype has died out? I would say the best entrepreneurs are the best consumers. Um, Steve Jobs is a, a great example. Um, if you even looked at the car he drove, he just had impeccable taste. If you look at uh, the electronics that he used at home. And in this case, uh, with uh, being, being like a power consumer, you kind of have to put yourself in the mindset of, of them. You have to understand, okay, what is a good price point? What is the value that I'm gaining out of this? And um, in a way, that's kind of a good way to kind of play devil's advocate is sometimes, oftentimes when you are an entrepreneur, you have a business, you can, there's a lot of tunnel vision where you really believe in your own hype and you believe this is never going to change. It's, it's always going to be like a gravy train like this, but you have to kind of be ready and, and know that sometimes um, when the market changes and sometimes you don't know, like, for example, a great example of this is um, with COVID-19, a lot of buffet style restaurants uh, are going to be hurting very soon. Like you saw how soup, soup, soup plantation um, they're filing for bankruptcy, uh, Neiman Marcus, like a lot of these um, big retailers and also like uh, bu buffet style, self-serving style restaurants, they're hurting and none of them knew that COVID was coming. Um, and in my case with my business, um, I think how I was able to evolve was I needed to kind of look on the horizon, like being a good entrepreneur, you also have to, if you see your business as a giant ship and you're like a pirate, you kind of have to be on the top of the deck and look out on the horizon and kind of sense and feel the intuition, see where things are going. And also utilizing data too. I think that's also important is having a balance of both intuition and trusting in your gut and seeing where the market is going and also seeing the data. Like what is the data showing you? Data showing us that people are shopping more online. So we should ramp up more of our D2C model and just make our shipping better, making our online experience better and everything. So I would say that's the best advice I can offer. So I have another audience question and I want you guys to play along with me a little bit. Um, if you can just close your eyes for like literally five seconds and I want you to imagine what mass adoption looks like for you. And then open and, and describe to me like Michelle, what does mass adoption even mean? What does it look like? It's hard to really say because it's it can, like my, the vision can be so abstract. I mean, no one, no one thought, I'm sure the person who invented the internet did not think we would be using it the way we use it today. And I would say where we're at right now with Bitcoin reminds me of the early days of the internet. I don't know if some of the viewers might be too young to remember, but I remember we had dial up where you had to use the phone and it made all these funny yeah. noises and everything and connected me to the online world, the World Wide web. And um, at that time, it was so groundbreaking, but not everyone was on the internet. I mean, people were still, in a, in a way, still in the traditional world, like television, magazines. Um, but I would say it wasn't, an, and you know, we also had to pay internet by the hour with AOL. So mm -hmm. it was a completely different um, space back then. And now today, we don't even think twice when we see like the, the wavy marks of Wi-Fi, like we see it, we're like, okay, you click on it right away. You know exactly what that means. You're gonna be connected online. You don't think to yourself, oh, I need to set up my phone my dial up and everything. And so I think there is going to be a, a, um, a time when things will shift, where Bitcoin will become like the Wi-Fi, where you don't think about it, it's ubiquitous in ev our everyday lives, whether we're making microtransactions or um, we're trading or um, um, you're trying to send money to your friends overseas. Like we don't really think that when we're using Venmo, like we don't think, Oh, how does it work? Like, how is this signal sending? A, like, we don't think that mm. we just know that it works. So I think mass adoption will come when we're, it's so ubiquitous in our system that we're not even thinking about how it works. We just know that it works. How about you, Alex? What do you think that mass adoption looks like? And when do you think it's likely to be closer? I love the phrase, slowly and then all at once. And I feel like that's what it, it, it feels like. I, I've been studying Bitcoin and, and crypto as a whole for a long time now. And it just feels like it used to be like every couple months there would be something new in the space or, and now at, at this point, it feels like every day there's like a new company, a new technology, some sort of innovation 
uh, both like on um, like on first layer and second layer solutions, and and just like the the amount of brilliant people that are coming into the space. And, and that's, I think, what it comes down to. It's the creators come first. Uh, I think, you know, as, as Michelle uh, showed with YouTube and, and built an you know, incredible career uh, around, the creators come first, they create something in, on this platform, and then the consumers come uh, and, and, and adopt it because it is better. Um, in, in our case, I think that, you know, it takes time to sort of lay the groundwork to make better experiences. Um, I think that it, it won't, um, I don't think necessarily that it will be Bitcoin immediately. I definitely take a very long-term view of Bitcoin. And I think there's going to be a lot of things that need to happen to get to this uh, inevitable future of hyper-Bitcoinization. Hyper uh, I think stable coins are going to be, play a major part um, over the next 10 years to get us to that hyper-Bitcoinization. And so I'm, I'm you know, doing a lot of research there of ways to make payments more efficient uh, between two parties, person to person, um, and person to business. Uh, and then, so I think that's going to be a big wave. And then once people are sending money back and forth and they realize that it's just an algorithm on top of really just the fed creating these rules, people don't want to play a game where the rules change every day. And so those, that game starts to change. And when people can choose to either have Bitcoin or have this, you know, sort of lawless, um, you know, system that they're, that they're transacting on, I think that they make a clear decision of what money they choose. And ultimately, people are going to choose the money that works best for them. And it's going to happen all at once. Gotcha. Um, we have another audience question for you, Michelle. They're curious to hear if you think there's a chance for an upstart blockchain social media project to dethrone mega platforms like YouTube, or do you think that there are reasons why um, YouTube and Web2 companies have really succeeded in ways that blockchain alternatives have yet to garner traction in? Well, it's, if you think about it, it took YouTube how many years for them to become the number one video site in the world? I mean, it was a long time. And I remember the early beginnings of YouTube back in 2006. It was, it's not what we know of today. I mean, it was mostly, it was similar to like Daily Motion, where you just saw a bunch of videos and cat videos and meme videos. Um, but today, YouTube is TV, when back then, 10 years ago, it was an online video site. And so um, I, I don't know if it, if it makes sense to dethrone something like a YouTube because I, like I mentioned before, I like to put myself in the shoes of a consumer. If I wanna watch a video, I'm immediately going to go on YouTube to look it up because YouTube is kind of like the Google video library of the world, mm -hmm. the world, the world that with the surface layer of the world because China's like a, a different story. I'm sure there's like a bunch of videos we can't access in China, which is crazy too. Um, but that being said, I do feel like there needs to be a major disruption in um, just like copyrights and rights management uh, in this space. Um, an example I like, I like to give of this is, uh, there is this one YouTube uh, channel that was known for uploading a lot of police body cam videos. And they were able to you know, have these videos and it, it was like a commons license. Anyone can use it as long as they credit uh, the original channel. And I think it was like a big major network. I forgot what it was, like A&E or one of those networks where they actually have a TV show where they use police body cams. And so they took a clip from that um, show or from that channel. And I think a year later, that channel got a claim from any A&E saying, you're, use, you're uh, using our video, um, we're gonna take it down. And so their video was disabled. They couldn't monetize from it yet they were the original owner of that video. So it kind of shows mm. that there are a lot of flaws. And, and YouTube, like they, they have to kind of play Switzerland. Like they don't want to piss off the creators. They also don't want to piss off the networks because they need both. Um, and I think that's why we do need, we just need a better solution in that space where you can't really be Switzerland. Like you have to be pro creator. Um, mm. And if there's a way for creators to upload their videos and there's like a block on there, there's a timestamp and anyone who wants to use that video in a compilation video or they want to remix it, um, that person can still, I don't know, maybe they can like earn small amounts of royalties or just something. They can earn something out of it rather than just getting their content stolen all the time. So I think uh, we're still in the early beginnings of this. Um, and I saw, I see some of the questions like, you know, my thoughts on DTube and Steemit, DLive. We're going to see a bunch of these. It's really like right now everyone's racing to be the next YouTube. I think you shouldn't think that way being the next YouTube. It should be a completely new system, a completely new platform uh, that is truly decentralized. 
So if we're thinking about a completely new system, a lot of people call that kind of decentralization Web3. And you were talking a little bit about the early days of the internet. What lessons do you think that we need to learn and implement when we're rebuilding the next version of the internet based on what we got wrong the first time? Uh, I would say data, like data privacy is gonna be really important. A lot of people are gonna, cause you, you think about it, like these big tech companies like Google and Facebook, they made so much money off of our data. And I'm not, I mean, personally, I'm not mad at it cause I use Google maps. I'm using their platform mm -hmm. a lot. But imagine like in the future, you have the youth and they, they know about this and they're gonna want something out of this. Like, hey, that'd be nice if I got some sort of check for my data. If I can get like a data check every month, that'd be great, you know? Rather than just like a stimulus, like the feds just print out like $6 billion, here's $1,200, here you go. It's like, actually it would be better if we had something that was more consistent, like a data check, that would be great. Um, that being said, um, I don't know what your thoughts are, Alex. Um, but I think like web 3.0, it's almost hard to imagine what's gonna look like because I'm pretty sure people who remember web point one, 1 1.0 didn't really imagine that we would be more mobile because web 1.0 was really mm -hmm. more of a desktop experience. Web 2.0, the experience became more, um, just came more intuitive. There's more mobile, um, mobile responsive websites. So you would have websites that also were mobile responsive on your phones and everything. And now everyone's just mostly using their phones. So I would say like web 3.0 might be more on the phone than 2.0 and 1.0, if that makes sense. Um, but these are all theories. What do I know? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, you had also mentioned privacy as an interest. Do you have any favorite Bitcoin related privacy tools or products? Well, I do like a lot of um, like wallets, like uh, Trezor, they make really great wallets. Um, I don't know. I mean, like, I don't know, Alex, what do you, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking too much too. I feel really yeah. bad for like no, I love it. thinking no, no, no. over this <laughs> and I'm getting tired of hearing Alex, my own Alex, do you have voice. any favorite? Uh, do yeah, you have I mean, any favorite, I, Alex? I love, uh, I think Cash App is, is incredible. It's, it's like really yes. tough to beat. Um, as far as, I mean, if you just tell somebody that they probably already have an app that they can go buy Bitcoin within 20 seconds, it's like, that's a tough experience to beat on just the on-ramp. Uh, and now, of course, it is for buying Bitcoin right now. Um, but that's, a, I think that's going to, I mean, we, we saw we saw the numbers from uh, the last quarter, and it's just like half of the revenue came from Bitcoin. And I think when you can take a mainstream business like Square that has public investors, and you can show that it, that Bitcoin is a real um, like business line, then all their competitors are, have got to be looking at them. So you know PayPal is looking at how they can get into the Bitcoin space and add an entire new revenue stream. Uh, you know that like every, you know every other payment in, in Neo Bank is looking at that. So the wave is coming, I think, for just better apps, better Bitcoin experiences. Um, the other, you know, I, I, I'm just been playing around in, in like test flight uh, with it, but the Lightning app is really good. Uh, I think that team is so smart. It's so close to, um, you know, the the core of what they're working on. And and just for sending payments, I, I'm just like super excited to be able to like, you know, run a Lightning node from my phone and send it to people. It's like, that's, it's so easy. And then also it's like, that's sort of the evolution. Like one of the things we talked about earlier is just like the funnel of Bitcoin usage. You're not truly using Bitcoin unless you're, you know, running your own node and sending, you know, from wallet to wallet and, and protecting your private keys. And so like, what I like to really think about is like, what does that funnel look like for the average consumer? How long does it take to go from a cash app or a lolly all the way to a direct lightning node, all the way to Bitcoin core? And what does that mean for, for a consumer? So, you know, when we, when we think about, you know, how did, how did somebody evolve to go consume from YouTube all the way to now TikTok, what does that evolution look like? And I think it's important to understand what that flow looks like and how to get them to the, the end result, which is ultimately hyper Bitcoinization. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I add something to that? If, yeah. I like uh, Alex, what you just mentioned about going from YouTube to TikTok because on both sides of the spectrums, I came from making uh, YouTube videos where it would mostly take like around a few days to make one video. If, if it's a very big video, it would take roughly around a week to produce just one video, a minimum of like around eight to 10 minutes, um, which is complete opposite of TikTok. I can bang out five TikToks in one day. 
because they're 10 seconds long. And you see that the barrier to entry is much lower on TikTok. Someone wouldn't feel like they would have to invest so much in camera and lighting and microphone um, when it comes to YouTube compared to TikTok where they have their phone and that's totally fine. They can use this and make content. So I could, I think like if that's the mindset that a lot of these apps and a lot of these uh, um, companies that are trying to figure out how can we make a product that can just make uh, Bitcoin and just crypto easier for uh, an average user, I think that's a mindset that they should adopt is you want to make something that um, something that where everyone can use and they don't have to invest so much in um, gear and equipment and everything. Yeah, we have another audience question. It's for Alex uh, that you had mentioned the Lightning Network. Is there currently any development towards that for Lolly? Are you guys thinking about any Lightning features? Uh, absolutely, yeah. We, we, I mean, we all personally play around with Lightning every day, um, and we actually just—I I don't—we uh, was we didn't make a huge announcement at, out of it, but we hired um, one of the more popular Lightning developers. Um, who he runs? Uh, his name's um, Federico. He he runs the Bitcoin uh, Lightning yeah. you know, network in in New York, uh, or the meetup in New York. Uh, and so he's he's super plugged in. He's brought a lot of really forward-thinking ideas. Um, my critical. Um, you know, one, one of the things I, I, like, I like to think about just on, on a product um, roadmap perspective is like you have, you have to keep in mind who our user is and our user it does not need lightning right now. Like the only thing that they really want is they want Bitcoin. And so if you, if you come to them and you introduce all these different types of, in, in their eyes, it's like different types of Bitcoin. And it's like they, if they have to understand what lightning is, what core is and everything, it's just going to be confusing. And, and, sh and sure, to like our Lightning developer friends, they're like, yeah, we would love if, you know, faster transfers uh, when we send it to them. But really, it doesn't change the actual user experience because 99% of people are keeping their Bitcoin in their Lolly wallet. So when we triage like our product roadmap, like sure, like I would love to go launch Lightning features all day, but we have a set amount of capital. We have a set amount of engineering resources. And, and, uh, and so we have to, you know, add the things that make the most sense. Uh, and at the end of the day, Lightning is also very early. Um, there's a lot of um, challenges that they have right now with scaling. And I'm super confident in, in Elizabeth and uh, Alex, the whole, you know, the whole Lightning team. I think they're absolutely brilliant. Um, Lightning Labs, by the way. There are multiple Lightning teams. Oh, yeah. Lightning Labs team. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you for specifying. Um, so yeah, I, I think the Lightning Labs team is, is brilliant and the stuff that they're doing on, on Lightning is, is incredible. I, they're making so much progress, like every week, I feel like they're launching a new, new feature. Um, so we're, we're following it very closely and we're gonna implement it as soon as it makes uh, sense to implement it. Michelle, I'm really curious to hear from you about the evolution of a consumer, right? Because I remember when I was younger, the way we would shop for makeup is completely different. And the things that we would want to buy I would never, when I was younger, think about contouring. That would seem like it was way too expert for me. But we have seen uh, makeup consumers evolve and become more mature as they think of themselves as self-taught experts. What do you expect to see when it comes to Bitcoin users as they mature and start to think of themselves as self-taught experts? Um, I mean, it's so true what you said, like contouring back then was considered a pretty, pretty expert level makeup technique that um, a lot of, um, a lot of these makeup artists that they train for, um, that they learn from, passed down from maybe like their mentors and everything. And in a way, uh, these beauty videos, they, they demystified the techniques. They made it seem like it, it was accessible to everyone. It's so easy. Um, you have this information gap. And I think that's how like a lot of these videos do so well. Like a lot of these clickbait videos, they show you this information gap. The information gap can be like, um, one coffee hack that can change your life. And it's like, wow, I want to know that one easy hack. What is that? Or in this case, like five steps to change your contouring game. Um, and I think like as, as we evolve in, this, in the Bitcoin space, that information gap is going to grow smaller and smaller and smaller because the information, there's going to be um, all of these different Bitcoin, um, I don't want to call it Bitcoin influencers because I know like in this space, like no one really likes that term influencer. Even I don't like the term influencers. Like, oh gosh, that I word. But I mean, I, I would like to maybe, maybe more like thought leaders, uh, Bitcoin mm -hmm. thought leaders. There's going to be a lot of different Bitcoin thought leaders who have um, a strong opinion, a strong approach, a strong uh, point of view. I'm not saying like there's only one that's right because this is such a new space and we're 
all learning every single day. There's always like new things to learn from it. And that being said, I think like, um, as I think like what I could see more is just like how these makeup tutorials basically made uh, users like you and myself, we become our own best makeup artist, our own best personal makeup artist, because who knows your face better than you. Um, in the future, I could actually see people, they see when they're holding like Satoshis, they're holding Bitcoin, they understand that I am my own bank. So I, if I'm my own bank, I need better security. I can't just like, like you, you ever go to a bank, it's not going to be open and you can just go in yeah. and waltz right into the safe. Like you need to have security. You have to have all of these layers. You have to have your private keys because like you can't just leave your keys right at the front door. Um, and so I could actually see users becoming more savvy about security and privacy, if anything. Yeah. I hear you on that 1010. Alex, is there anything that you also wanted to leave us with in terms of what you expect to see from the consumer journey as people move toward thinking about being their own bank? Um, honestly, I think the, it has to get bigger on the beginning of the funnel. So the with the customer journey, it's like everybody's going after this like tiny group of people that are would consider themselves like Bitcoiners or people who are into crypto right now. And I don't think a lot of people in the space realize how small it feels like you're in a bubble sometimes of just like this like cult that is you know obsessed with like all private key management and all stuff and that is stuff is so important and I'm a big believer it in it but like when, I mean I mean I, when I go home to like North Carolina when I go like well, before COVID visit my friends in Omaha and Minneapolis and Chicago you're reminded that nobody knows what this thing is and yeah they just need they they just want Bitcoin they want to make money. They want to like, they're fascinated with like, what, you know, what is this thing that like everybody's talking about? And, and so I, I, I really believe the most important piece is not that like, there are plenty of people building in that space. I don't, I don't think there's enough that are making like the pie bigger, like bringing it to the 99% of people, 99.9% .9 of people that don't have Bitcoin that have not gotten into crypto and have no clue what it is. Gotcha. Michelle, are there any last thoughts that we didn't get a chance to touch on earlier that you wanted to leave the audience with? Um, no, I think we covered a lot. If you guys have any more questions, you can always tweet at Alex and myself or just DM me on Instagram. I can try my best to um, reply back. Um, and happy having everyone. Thank you to all the miners. We appreciate you. We love you. Yes, we very much appreciate the miners. And thank you so much, both Michelle and Alex, for joining us today.